Um, okay, so it's recording, I think, yes. All right, uh, I'd have to share my screen. Okay, um, so everyone can hear me, right? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. So let's just very quickly go over uh, cross-site request forgery, uh, which is where we had stopped. Then we will look at some defenses for cross-site request forgery. Okay, so here's the basic um, here's the basic uh, template of the attack. Uh, there are two sites. There is uh, a victim, which is in this particular case shown as A.com, and there is an attacker, which is B.com, uh, and uh, the user is somehow tricked into visiting the attacker's uh, website or an iframe. And the victim also has a vulnerability uh, in the sense that the victim does not invalidate the cookies on the uh, on the uh, browser of the of the end user uh, when the end user navigates away from that website okay so the cookie is active and uh, what happens here is that the attacker sends an http request to the victim and uh, uh, so when when the when the victim when the end user goes and accidentally visits b.com b.com creates or uh, has in its web page code that ends up sending an HTTP request to the victim website, a.com. And what happens here, sorry, go ahead. I, I can't hear. What's the question? Okay, so looks like somebody just joined. Okay, so uh, where is the, yeah, there it is. So what ends up happening is that the browser uses the cookies of a.com and attaches it together with that HTTP request, okay? And uh, a.com just assumes that the request actually came from the uh, from the end user clicking through and making that request, okay? So it so turns out that in this particular case, and I had asked you to think about this, the browser is actually a confused deputy. Right, the browser has uh, the cookies for a.com, it has the cookies for b.com, uh, but the only problem is that the browser does not know when to use the cookies of a.com, right? Uh, it should use it when the request originates from the, uh, from the end user, but in this particular case, the request is coming from b.com and uh, b.com's request to a.com ends up taking that cookie from the browser and then setting it off, okay? so. You can model this as a confused deputy problem where the browser is a confused deputy. And when we studied the confused deputy attack, uh, I told you that when there is, whenever you can model a problem as a confused deputy attack, there is always a solution that should come to your mind. And what was that solution? Well, the solution was capabilities, right? So what are capabilities? Capabilities, uh, one way to think about it, uh, uh, in, a, in a manner that's more general than just thinking about it as access control is an unforgeable token so that if you own the token you're able to access some particular service okay so we will see some defenses for cross-site request forgery one of which is going to be a capability based defense to this uh, uh, to the attack and this is actually the most widely deployed defense against cross-site request forgery almost everybody uses this particular defense uh, uh, against cross-site request forgery. Any website these days uses this. And many a time actually now, once now that you're educated about cross-site request forgery, you will actually, I will, I will alert you to go and look at the URLs whenever you are going and visiting, let's say a bank website or, or something like that, you will see something called a CSRF token right in the URL it's embedded. Uh, it's a rather long value. And uh, that is the, uh, that's the capability based defense to, to cross-site request forgery attacks. So let's look at some common defenses. Um, we'll see why they work, why they don't work, and so on. Okay. So yeah. So this is just a pictorial representation. There is the victim sitting in front of the browser. The bank is the vulnerable website, and uh, the end user has 
the cookies are the bank stored on their browser. The bank is actually the uh, the website that did uh, that did not uh, implement a defense against cross-site request forgery. Uh, you somehow end up visiting the attacker's website. The attacker basically sends this HTML, right, uh, which includes some action on an API or a service that the bank is exposing. So the bank in this particular case is exposing a transfer service where you can specify, you know, the name of the recipient and the value. Of course, you know, these days, if you do this in a bank in India, there is OTP based uh, authentication as well. That's called second factor authentication. So this particular case over here doesn't consider those second factor authentications, right? But it's showing you it's a realistic scenario. Not everybody uses two factor authentication. But the idea here is that this, uh, this service is invoked by the attacker by just pasting this stuff, this code on their on the web page that's rendered. And so what happens is that, uh, so this is a request that's sent to bank.com. So the victim's browser just attaches the existing cookie to that request and that ends up going to the bank. And that's what the cookie is shown here together with the session ID. And the request is successfully completed by the bank because just presenting the token, the, the, the cookie to the bank, in some sense authenticates this user to the bank. Right. So the bank thinks that it is this user who is actually performing the transaction, whereas in fact it's not. This user has been tricked into performing the transaction by this attacker. Okay. So that's the classic uh, cross-site request forgery attack. I'll show you some another variant of it called login uh, CSRF. We'll look at that slightly later uh, in this in today's presentation. Uh, but let's look at some basic defenses. So the very first one uh, called secret validation token is the uh, is the uh, capability based defense. I'll talk about it. Uh, we'll also look at some other easy defenses, referral validation and custom HTTP header. But we'll see that there are some practical uh, uh, issues to their deployment. OK, so we will see all of that. OK, so what is this defense called secret token validation? So the idea is that the web server, the bank.com web server, in every active web session, what they do is that they include a hard to guess secret that is encoded along with every HTTP request that comes or along with the HTML form that comes from the bank. OK, so let's go back to this picture over here. So in some sense, whenever the bank is, has an active session with the victim browser, the bank actually sends an HTML page that contains uh, a, a long random number that is hard to guess. OK, so that whenever the victim browser, whenever the user actively clicks through a request, that same random number goes back to the bank along with the cookie, of course. So the cookie is going to be attached anyway, but the bank generates this long random number that is there on all requests for that particular session. So that whenever there is an active session and the victim end, or the, the user ends up clicking uh, you know, some action on the bank, let's say to transfer money, that long random number also goes to the bank. Okay. So now the bank maintains a list of you know, currently active sessions together with these session identifiers, which is unique from this session identifier, right? And the bank realizes that it's an active session and therefore completes it. Now, why does this work? Well, the reason that this works is because, you know, the attacker over here is just presenting an HTML page uh, that says bank.com transfer together with the attacker name and, uh, uh, and the amount to be transferred. So, in this particular case, if you include this defense, the attacker will not be the, the request from the attacker will not work because the attacker will not be able to include that random session identifier generated by the bank on the HTML request that the browser sends. Right. In some sense, that's hard coded on everything that the bank is sending to the victim browser. And because that random number is not there, that's called a CRS, CSRF token. Uh, this request over here will fail because the bank does not see that CSRF token in this request. And the security of this scheme uh, arises from the fact that the attacker is not going to be able to guess that random number, right? That random number is a large, maybe, you know, uh, 10, 24 bit value whose value that the attacker cannot guess. Okay, so if the attacker has some hard coded uh, HTML on their web page that the victim just tries to click through, even though the cookie is attached, that particular random number will not be there in the request and therefore the bank will reject it. So why is this a capability based defense? The reason it is a capability based defense is because that CSRF token that's generated by the bank that's included in that request 
is the capability, right? It is an unforgeable entity that the attacker cannot forge except for random guessing uh, that whose, whose presence in the request authorizes the, uh, the, uh, the holder of that request to, uh, uh, or in some sense, authenticates the, 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 the holder of that request, in addition, of course, to the cookie being valid, which the browser will attach anyway, okay? So if that token is not valid, then the, uh, then the request will not go through by the bank, okay? So that's what this is. It's a secret token that's added by the, uh, uh, by the, uh, by the bank server. And, uh, you know, there are many implementations of this uh, secret token. You can include a session identifier, uh, something that's session independent, or you can have an HMAC of a session identifier. Uh, but the important thing is that this is a separate entity than the cookie, right? It's not the cookie. It's something else that the server actually generates that they include together with the to the web with the web forms that are sent to the uh, uh, to the client. Nothing is stored locally on the on the victim's browser uh, in the way that cookies are stored. Uh, but rather the the code that's sent to you itself contains this this uh, this session identifier. Okay, so the absence of that session identifier will mean that the uh, the bank is not going to uh, process that request. So that's how CSRF is defended against. Okay, so uh, you see over here, this is uh, from some time ago. I don't think this website is valid uh, anymore. It was a cloud-based service uh, to actually go and uh, uh, rent virtual machines on the cloud. But you see now, you know, in the request that is sent from the uh, uh, from in this particular case, the host is slice host. You can see a long random value that is embedded along with the HTML that is sent to the client, so that you know every request from here goes with that particular value. Okay, so you will see a web page that has this value. Your friend might see a different value, and so on. So the attacker cannot just create a web page with a random value that the Browse that the that the web server in this particular case slice host has active for you. Okay, so you can see this is a really large number. Each one of these numbers over here is a four uh, bit value. So you can do the calculation here for how long this is. Right, I believe it's on the order of like two fifty six bits over here. Okay, okay. So that's the secret token validation based defense. Uh, that's the long random value. Uh, so that's the most commonly used defense these days. And uh, sometimes you see, uh, you know, the CSRF token actually being embedded in the URL itself, right? Of course, HTTPS, that long random value cannot be even read by the, uh, by a network based attacker because everything goes on top of DNS. Okay, so that's that. Uh, let's look at some other defenses uh, that are somewhat easier to think of. Those might actually come to you first when you're thinking about uh, uh, about uh, CSRF defenses, but we'll see why they don't work. Okay, so one solution is referral validation. Okay, so what is referral validation? So let's go back to that picture with the attack. So whenever you send a request, right, that goes from here, uh, your browser actually attaches uh, some information together with that request, which actually talks about the referrer. In this particular case, the request is going from the victim's browser to the bank, but the referrer was attacker.com. Okay. So if the victim browser, if the if the end user actually clicked through the request and the request went actively because of the user's interaction, the referrer would be bank.com. Okay. So. The, you would think that bank.com can actually prevent cross site request forgery by just looking at the referrer header. This is all part of the HTTP header that goes as part of the HTTP traffic. So you can see over here, right here, you can see. Uh, so the referrer is attacker.com slash blog. Okay. So if bank.com were intelligent enough, they can just look at the referrer field and see that the ref, there's a mismatch between, you know, what they expect to see as a referrer and what's attached as the referrer by the victim's browser and therefore reject the request. Okay, so this is a very simple defense, you know, so if there is such a simple defense, why not going for this? Why going for this complicated, you know, CSRF token based defense? So there is a good argument for that. And uh, let me just go and sort of talk about it. Um, okay. So the referrer header, first of all, let me just tell you. So the referrer header, right? So the referrer could be facebook.com. 
if the you know facebook used to implement this so if the request is coming from facebook.com accept the request if the referral is coming from attacker.com reject it okay so easy enough question is what happens if your referral is empty right uh, so think about it right i mean the referrer is a piece of information that is attached by your web browser and so in some sense you're relying on the web browser to attach this piece of information let's go back to that picture once again uh, so this referrer field over here is attached by your web browser and in fact it's part of the http header and anybody can modify it right uh, in fact if you're within uh, an enterprise environment chances are that your enterprise uh, network gateway is going to strip off the referrer. And I will show you an example of that right now. Uh, the reason is because they don't want to <coughs> provide internal path names. You might have clicked on some internal document and that internal document may actually have referred you to the victim's website. And uh, so, for example, you know, you know, let's say you work for a company and then they hard code the bank's uh, URL in the payroll web page. Okay? And you go and click the bank's web page over there. You know, the internal URL of the web page that referred to bank.com is going to be put as part of the referrer. So generally speaking, corporate enterprises don't like that when the internal path names are referred uh, on in the referrer field. So they either modify it or they drop it uh, because of privacy considerations. And I will show you one concrete example of this uh, right away. OK, so if the referrer field is empty, then the question is, what do you do? Right. I mean, there are two options you can take. You can use the lenient approach or the strict approach. Um, and you can say, look, if the referral is missing, uh, just let things true. Uh, in which case, you know, again, you have let through attacks or you could use strict referral validation saying that the referral has to be present. Otherwise, the request will not go through. And in that case, you have uh, false positives. Right. I mean, it might be a benign request, but the bank or the or the website that you're trying to uh, access is going to reject your request because the referrer is empty. And you, the end user, have absolutely no idea why your request was rejected because you, the end user, don't really you know, think about what's going in the HTTP header. Think about it, right? When you check your email, do you check, do you check the HTTP referrer header? You don't. You just expect your, your email to come and show up in your, in, your, uh, in your browser window. And if there's a strange error, you'll be wondering, left wondering why. So most end users don't understand that. So you're left with a dilemma as to what to do if the referral header is empty. <clears throat> so here's a concrete example for why corporate enterprises end up, you know, not including the the uh, the HTTP header. And uh, in order to understand the significance of this particular URL over here, you have to understand from when this particular paper uh, uh, was written. The particular paper that I'm talking about right now for cross-site request forgery defenses came in 2008. Okay, and that was the time when the iPhone project was actually uh, uh, announced by, uh, by, by Apple. And it was a big, big deal, right? I mean, uh, some of you may be too young to remember, but you know, there were days before the smartphone when you, know, you just had feature phones and smartphones were not ubiquitous the way they are now. iPhone really changed that. And it was a really mega project for Apple that changed the way that, you know, people now think about Apple and so on. So now imagine, you know, like, let's say there was an employee sitting with, a, with an Apple who was trying to navigate to some web page. Uh, and that web page was referred to by this guy over here, this particular web page over here, internet.com.apple, which is an internet website slash project slash iPhone slash competitors dot HTML. Okay. Now the referrer is going to the referrer field is going to leave the enterprise and then go outside. But doesn't matter, you know, what the uh, referrer sees. If the referrer just sees this one name over here called iPhone, that's a big leak, right? I mean, it talks of a project that was like considered super secret for Apple and just the name of the URL sometimes reveals information. Okay, so this is just a simple example, but you can now see, you can begin to see why corporate enterprises don't like referral headers from their internal, uh, uh, you know, sort of web pages being, being leaked to outside requests. So uh, typically organizations end up stripping uh, the, uh, the network referral header. Um, it is also stripped by the browser whenever there are HTTPS to HTTP transitions, right? I mean, whenever you're viewing an HTTPS web page, there's HTTP content, 
the browser actually removes the referral header. Um, again, different browsers do this differently, right? It all depends on the implementation of the browser. The user can set a preference saying, I don't want to include HTTP headers. Uh, there could be buggy user agents. You know, you might install an extension that uh, ends up removing uh, HTTP headers by mistake. So all of these cases, right? I mean, uh, the victim website or the bank.com cannot really afford to block these users. So this is why HTTP referral header, uh, although it seems like a logical solution, is uh, actually runs into practical difficulties, right? So you cannot always, and, and the problem always arises from, the, from this empty referral uh, uh, field where, you know, you really don't know what to do if the referral is empty, okay? So in order to solve that, uh, referral validation is not really a good solution for cross-site request forgery. And this is why, you know, we, the, the more commonly adopted solution is that of uh, uh, the, the CSRF tokens. There's one more defense. Let me just talk about that as well, and then take questions. Uh, okay, yeah, so, yeah, so uh, uh, another one, right, lenient validation. If your site uses HTTPS, are you safe? Uh, in some sense, you know, you, you're using HTTPS, uh, the origin is authenticated. The problem is that uh, the browser does not append the referrer if the source of the request is not an HTTP page, right? So the source of the request, right, the request can go to the victim website, but the request itself can be sourced from a non-HTTP page, like, you know, an FTP page, for example, or a regular, uh, you know, some, some other protocol. So FTP attacker.com slash attack, and then what happens is now when the request goes out, the, the referrer is not attached. So again, same problem, the, uh, the, the bank.com or the victim website doesn't really know, uh, know what to do in this particular case. You can reject, but of course you might reject a lot of uh, 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 you know, valid requests. If you accept, of course, now you're letting through attacks. Oops. Uh, Something is happening where my slides are going off their own. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So both strict and lenient have problems. I think I have already spoken about the problems of strict and lenient. Uh, so so I think I can move forward over here. So both solutions have problems, and the problems arise from the empty referral field. Okay. Oops. Okay. Okay. So this is the third solution, which is custom header defenses and so custom header defenses come from the fact that you know uh, sometimes you know you can actually include custom headers in your in your web browser uh, right your web browser can attach new uh, uh, um, you know headers that are sent as part of the request so for example and this goes as part of the uh, as part of the http header so over here you know like you know i can send this so this, this new header called X requested by and put H, XML HTTP request, okay? So the set request header, right, within the origin can actually ask for the browser to include this particular header within the web page, within the HTML uh, that's generated, that's going to be sent over to the, uh, to the website, okay? So, um, again, you know, so Ajax requests, which are interactive HTML, like on Google Maps, typically you will see that there is a HTML header that's added called XML HTTP request. XML HTTP request is a JavaScript network request that originates from your web browser. And so generally browsers tag uh, the request this way. Okay. So the, uh, so the problem, of course, is that, you know, not all browsers support this. And so it might not work across all domains. And so even though this is an effective defense, uh, people with legacy browsers are not going to be able to adopt the solution. So therefore, again, you end up uh, sort of uh, either having false positives or false negatives for a section of uh, the users who are using your website. Okay, so none of these solutions is as effective or as or has as broad coverage as the uh, uh, as the CSRF token based defense. In any case, right? I mean, like one of the things that this paper does, which is the required reading for uh, this one, this per this this particular portion of the course, it's called robust defenses for cross-site request forgery. It actually does a survey of 
all of the known defenses at that point, which was 2008, um, for cross-site request forgery, and sort of does a compare of how many websites use what defense, and then they sort of talk about the best defense. So it's a very, very well-written paper, um, and it does like a really thorough job of the survey of the known defenses. So that's the required reading for, uh, for uh, CSRF defenses. And I think that at this point, the consensus has emerged in the community that the secrets that the secret token based validation is the way forward and so that is what is adopted by most websites now okay so let's just uh, yeah all right so that's the basic csrf um, and now what i'm going to do is i'm going to actually talk about like a slightly uh, different uh, CSRF attack that's also actually talked uh, about in this paper this is a login CSRF attack. Okay, so this is uh, the first time you see it, it, it is actually it's somewhat contrived. I really don't know, you know, what's the real world impact of this login CSRF, but this is the, ba the way it works. Let's just look at it. Uh, so again, you know, over here, let's assume that the end user over here has some credentials with, uh, with uh, Google and those credentials uh, you know, they have supplied and therefore there's a cookie for this victim browser that's stored on their website. Now the end user ends up uh, visiting the attacker's web page by mistake and the same thing over here, right? Uh, they sort of embed this, uh, this uh, login information and the problem is that now uh, this login information, so let's say that there's a login screen. Uh, oh, by the way, so uh, let's assume that the, uh, you know, the, the end user has credentials with Google.com, but that they have not actually logged in, right? In the sense that uh, cookies are not currently stored. There are, no, there are no cookies currently with the victim's web browser. Let's assume that that's the case, but that the victim actually has uh, an, uh, uh, an account with Google, okay? So now what happens is that the attacker actually sends, so this is login CSRF, it only works on login pages. The attacker creates uh, uh, a hidden URL of this sort so that, you know, when there is, uh, they're, they're targeting the login application, they send in their username and password, okay? So now what happens is that the victim's browser actually uh, forwards this request over to Google. There is no cookie to attach because, as I said, even though the victim has an account with Google, they're not currently logged in, so the browser uh, doesn't have a cookie. But the attacker has logged in uh, uh, because they have supplied their credentials and Google just says everything is okay, right? Because they have got the correct credentials for the attacker. And now what happens is that you, uh, the end user, uh, are logged in as the attacker, right? Now you might ask me what sense does this make? If I navigate to gmail.com, I'm actually going to see the, the attacker's inbox. That's true, right? Um, but the particular scenario they talked about was, you know, let's say that you end up logging over here and that now you do some browsing, okay? So now your browsing history, as you know, is associated with your account on Google. And so now you search for a term over here, in this particular case, you search for llamas, right? Now the attacker is going to learn your, uh, your web browsing history, okay? So Google is a poor example for this because most of us, you know, in, in addition to searches, we go to, to Gmail and the minute the attacker or the victim goes and logs into Gmail in this case, uh, they will know that they're not logged in. But the idea is that unless you look at the top right hand side corner of your of your browser and look at who's logged in, uh, you know, uh, you might end up doing some browsing uh, and the attacker might end up learning your history. I agree it's kind of a contrived attack, but it talks about this variant that is not, that's somewhat of a slightly different attack scenario than the original classic CSRF attack. But this is also a CSRF attack because now what happens is that uh, the same thing, right? The, the, the vulnerability lies over here in this uh, google.com server that ends up uh, processing this attacker's request and the end user logs in, uh, the, the end user browses with the attacker's credentials and then proceeds to uh, to, to learn, uh, the attacker proceeds to learn the victim's browsing history. They actually show some vulnerabilities in real websites. Uh, let me just move. Uh, so as you can see over here, the attacker's credentials are supplied. And whenever you search, 
your searches get get added to the to the attacker's web history. So they had this. Uh, I think they observed a real instance of this attack uh, with PayPal, which is uh, this online uh, uh, payments platform. Where what happens is that the attacker ends up providing their PayPal credentials, uh, just like this, right? In the in the previous slide, they provide their PayPal credentials. So you log when you click this 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 link over here. It logs in into PayPal, but with the attacker's credentials. And what happens is that typically, when you log into PayPal, right, uh, you actually have to uh, have to enter your uh, your bank information or credit card information, right? Uh, and what generally happens is that when you log into PayPal, you enter your bank credentials, you enter your your uh, credit card credentials, and you use that for future transactions. Now, what happens if you log in? Uh, and you click that PayPal, and the, the, the attacker actually sends you their PayPal information. Uh, what is, ends up happening is that if you enter your bank credentials or your credit card information, you're entering it into the attacker's PayPal uh, uh, you know, account. So they are able to get hold of your bank details. They are able to get hold of your credit card details. And this happens through login CSRF because the attack happens exactly at the moment where you're going to log into PayPal. You click, of course, maybe you have not logged into PayPal before, but the attacker is going to send in uh, their credentials uh, as part of this step over here. And then when you do subsequent activity, for example, attack, uh, adding your credit card or your bank details, you're adding it to the attacker's profile who can then take that and then misuse your credit card. right? So that's they observed a real instance of this, and so this is an example of a login CSRF attack. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, all right. So this is just a summary, right, uh, of the of CSRF attacks. So they talk about this. Of course, it's a variant. Uh, you can also think about defenses for login CSRF, and you can go and ask yourself, you know, whether the referrer or the uh, the uh, uh, the custom header or the session identifier based defenses actually work against this this variant of login CSRF. Okay, all right. So uh, so basically, we have spoken about some different uh, approaches for cross site request forgery defenses, uh, and uh, you know the current consensus is that server side defenses, which is the secret side secret uh, token validation is the best way to move forward. And in fact, if you use modern web development languages, uh, they give an example of Ruby on Rails, but almost everyone has it nowadays. It's sort of part of the of the language development API. You've got libraries that generate these secret tokens for you. So you as a programmer don't really have to explicitly worry about it anymore. Um, but yeah, so that's CSRF and CSRF defenses. Uh, we are half an hour into the class. Let me just briefly stop here for uh, any questions before I move to cross-site scripting defenses. Uh, let's go to the Teams window. Any questions so far about CSRF, CSRF defenses and so on? So the challenge for you guys is next time you go to check whether you have got your uh, MHRD stipend, uh, by the way, I hope all of you have started getting that. Uh, when you log into your bank, go see the uh, the URL. Generally speaking, what happens is that the CSRF token gets appended. You act, it is actually called CSRF token uh, by many websites based on the, of course, the backend implementation of a bank. Uh, try to locate it right, uh, and see if it's actually attached. Uh, okay, so for a while, the CSRF was one of the most dangerous vulnerabilities out there, right? Uh, uh, the top 10, any top 10 list would contain cross site request uh, forgery based attacks in them as well. Any questions? Okay, so no questions, we can move on to uh, cross site scripting and cross site scripting attacks, but uh, let's very briefly look at uh, the a review of the of the attack itself. Yes, somebody had a question. Sir, uh, uh, Shashank here. Uh, yes. 
in the referred url concept uh, i was just confirming like uh, when we open a url from bookmarks or we type it in the address bar then too i think the refer is empty so that's also going to be a problem right is that right are... i uh, i mean what they attach like something like local host or something if it it could be empty i don't know it depends on the browser because at okay. the end of the day it's the browser yeah. that chooses to attach it right okay it could be self it could be like local host okay yeah yes Yes, uh, you might actually But, want to see this, right? I mean, use something like Wireshark, capture the packets, and then see what different yes. browsers do. Uh, honestly speaking, I don't know different browsers and browsers. You have like a new version every week, so it's hard to it's hard to sort of uh, have like a stable policy with the referred uh, uh, referred based solution. If they have some sort of let's assume they have some sort of self or local host type mechanism, then to get requests will be vulnerable to CSRF attacks because. clicking on a url will directly lead to opening of that in a browser window and there will be no referral right, right. there well that depends on whether you have chosen strict or lenient right and so right. that right. you you have this dilemma of whether to choose strict or whether to do, choose lenient depending upon what the end uh, website does right i mean if they use strict the uh, reject the uh, approval the the request will be rejected if they choose lenient yes the attack is going to proceed forward right uh, so either case you have a problem sometimes legit request gets blocked sometimes attacks are let through yeah okay uh, so the other complication with the browser is that you know generally speaking browsers are not stand alone entities most of us uh, uh, you know deploy some plugins or some extensions so you know you go to the chrome extension gallery download a, an extension and then put it with chrome maybe because you want a fancy background each one of these extensions actually behaves differently and each one of the extensions works with browser privilege in the sense that they have the full privileges of whatever the browser can do so some of these extensions might also choose to strip http headers and you know you might not really know the problem that that's the source of the problem because you install this extension and hey the http referrer all of a sudden is empty or is pre populated with some value and uh, unless you uninstall that extension you know that behavior won't go away so it's very hard to reason about browsers in isolation you know you have to always talk about the browser plus whatever local extensions you have installed and uh, the extensions can have a non trivial effect on the behavior of the browser including for instance changing what the http header looks like because they can operate with the full privileges of the browser yes. so yeah okay all right Okay, so uh, let's uh, quickly look at uh, recap of uh, uh, cross-site scripting attacks. Uh, the first time you look at it, of course, it does take a little bit of time to understand cross-site scripting. Uh, and so let's oh, that's that only. Yeah. So let's look at the a very brief review of cross-site scripting attacks, and then we will see uh, what the uh, what one proposed defense is. Right? It's by no means the only defense uh, against cross-site scripting. in fact last class i believe somebody spoke about the browser side defense those are perfectly valid as well but here's the basic review of cross site scripting attacks there are three actors there's the victim's browser there is a website uh, that is the uh, one that's running a vulnerable web application uh, in this case hello.cgi that's just going to reflect back whatever inputs are provided to it and there is the attacker right and so we assume that the victim has in the first step logged into naive.com and naive.com's cookie is stored in the victim's browser the goal of the attack is for the uh, attacker to steal that cookie off this victim with naive.com and then later on impersonate the victim with naive.com right that's the objective of the attack so let's see how it's accomplished the first step of course is that the victim is tricked into visiting evil.com and this is through a number of social engineering attacks where they end up accessing some web page that takes them to evil.com right they just click on some email or some embedded url or something like that so they end up going to evil.com you don't actually actively have to type evil.com in your uh, web browser that's the uh, that's sort of the next summary of what i'm trying to say here okay and what comes back from evil.com is a frame that sorts at naive.com that's invoking the hello.cgi application but instead of hello invoking it with uh, you know the name having to be some literal it is invoking it with something that you know can be interpreted as code if you choose to interpret it as code uh, by the way i don't know how many of you went and typed 
something embedded within the script tag within your Facebook wall and saw what happened. Uh, anybody tried this? I mentioned it in the last class. Okay, I have a funny anecdote about this as well, and I will, I will, I will talk about it. Um, so, just after after describing the attack. Okay, so what this does is that this forces the victim's browser to actually uh, send this uh, HTTP GET request to hello.cgi. Of course, now you know the stuff shown in red is just get carried over. Nive.com is uh, a page that just reflects back uh, this untrusted input. So now it's going to create an HTML page together with this stuff over here. Of course, now it's an HTML page with the script tag embedded. And so uh, the script within whatever is within the script is executable JavaScript. And it's just going to be executed by this victim's browser. In this particular case, the script is saying, look, open a pop-up box that is source at evil dot, uh, uh, dot com. Uh, it's going to invoke a steel.cgi application. Doesn't matter whether that application exists here or not, but attach as an argument the cookie, and then the cookie is now going to be referred to locally as document.cookie. And because this code over here is executing under which iframe, it's executing under the iframe of type.com, the same origin policy of the browser says, hey, the cookie that's supposed to be attached with this request is that of knife.com. So attach it over here. That's what this documented cookie refers to under the same origin policy. Just attach it and then send this request. Okay. So now what happens is that uh, that that uh, request ends up attaching the cookie uh, and sends this HTML and uh, this HTTP GET request. Doesn't really matter now whether you have the steel.cgi application there. The evil.com the HTTP request goes with the contents of the cookie and evil.com therefore gets the cookie. Okay, so this is a very simple reflected cross-site scripting attack. Uh, actually, I was a victim of this. Um, not really a victim. Um, let me see if I can open up my inbox and share this. So um, at some point, I used to work on, uh, on web security. Uh, and uh, I used to work on, uh, um, you know, JavaScript security and so on. So I ended up um, submitting a paper to this conference on uh, on web security. Let me see if I if I can find the full transcript. Um, wait a minute. I can even show you if I have it. If I don't have it, unfortunately, I won't be able to. No, sorry, I don't have it. Anyway, so let me give you the high level bit of exactly what happened there. So what happened was that I was, as I told you, working on this paper on JavaScript security. So one of the things that happens when you submit a conference paper is that you have this chance to rebut your request. Uh, the, you know, there are comments that are given by the peer reviewers and uh, you, know, you get a chance to respond to these, uh, to these peer reviewers about their comments. Right. So they had some questions about our work. And so we wanted to provide a code example uh, to illustrate our point. So we wrote this code example and we put it within a script tag. Of course, you know, the entire conference interface is an HTML interface, the web server. And, uh, you know, this this it was a form field where you can type your response back to the to the reviewers. Now, in that form field, we ended up presenting examples of code that we were working on. And of course, you know, because we were working on JavaScript code, we sort of illustrated it with the script tag. And we submitted the request to the reviewers, right? We submitted a response to the reviewers. The problem was we kept submitting our response and the response kept getting dropped, right? We could never see the fact that our response was submitted. The problem was that the conference review web server was looking at our response uh, that we submitted within the form field saw the script tag and decided to completely strip it off. It thought that we were trying to launch a cross-site scripting attack against the conference website uh, and uh, refused to accept our uh, uh, our response to the reviewers. And so finally, of course, we resolved it by not submitting things with the script tag. But this sort of goes to show that, you know, the, uh, the conference website was actually cognizant of the fact that, you know, people could try to submit HTML and then try to 
uh, uh, somehow subvert their website and it attempt it detected our attempt as a potential cross-site scripting attack. So that's why I'm challenging you. You know, go to any website that accepts inputs from you, be it Twitter, be it you know Facebook, whatever it is, uh, and try to see you know what happens if you embed something within a script tag. It could be as simple as you know put within a script tag, put alert hello, right? What does alert do? Alert just opens a pop-up box with the word hello in it. Uh, and see what happens, right? I mean, uh, it's instructive uh, in, in terms of understanding how these defenses are implemented. So what Facebook will do, and I can tell you right now, is that you know it's just going to uh, treat that as text and not as executable HTML, right? So that's what uh, Facebook does. They implemented it by uh, uh, most websites actually implement it using what is called prepared statements. I also spoke about prepared statements for SQL injection attacks, but this is a way of, of realizing where you can embed HTML, executable HTML code, executable JavaScript code, and where in the website you should not be uh, uh, having executable HTML code, okay? So that's the defense for cross-site scripting. And uh, the paper that we are going to talk about now, this blueprint, is one realization of that, of that defense. Uh, but it it actually navigates a very uh, uh, crowded field. A lot of people have worked on this. And in this particular case, they talk about a defense that is browser agnostic, okay? In the sense that if you go and look back at our, uh, our uh, uh, cross-site scripting, you will remember one, my, one instance where I spoke about the MySpace firm, where even though the MySpace web server had uh, implemented defenses for cross-site scripting, there was a way to bypass it because one particular browser, in particular the Internet Explorer browser at that point, chose to interpret this Java new line script as JavaScript. Okay, so even if you had content that had Java and new line script, the filter on the MySpace web page will not interpret that as JavaScript, but that the Internet Explorer browser would. And so there was a mismatch in the understanding of what the browser thought was executable code and what the Web browser thought, or the web application developer thought was uh, was executable code and that led to this particular attack over here, where you know this difference in semantics between what the web application developer thought as executable code, what the browser thought of as executable code, there was a small gap. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is a defense that attempts to close that gap, where the web application developer's view of what is supposed to be executable code and what is not is reflected in the browser irrespective of which browser you're using, okay? It could be Internet Explorer, it could be Microsoft Edge, it could be Chrome, whatever it is, whatever the web application developer thinks should be executable code is reflected in the web browser as well. And if the web application developer says that this particular region of the web page should never have executable code, for example, you know, what you type in your Facebook wall window, that will be reflected in the content that is finally generated and sent back to you. Okay, so that's a very high level summary of Blueprint. Let's look at the details though, right? Uh, okay, so this is, again, this is a paper that's around 11 years old. Uh, there is a lot of work, cross-site scripting uh, defenses following on to this. Uh, we can't study them all in the in the confines of one course. And the, and the problem with choosing like a recent paper is that they will refer to a whole ton of prior work. And unless you have all of that context, it is very difficult to read the paper and understand and place it in the context of all of that prior work. That is why I chose one of the earlier papers. Don't think that the course is outdated. I chose some of the earlier papers because uh, it is easier to understand the defense, the basic essence of the defense without having to place it in the context of all of this related work that has followed and gone on after this. Anyway, so uh, let me just go over the, the, uh, uh, the, the problem. If you look at any web page of this sort, in this particular case, you know, something like Wikipedia, <coughs> it is always the case that these uh, websites that accept end user content have, uh, you can sort of uh, categorize them into, uh, into two parts. Uh, the trusted portion of the web page and the untrusted portion of the web page. So the trusted portion of the web page is something that the website developer actually controls. So Wikipedia, you know, the logo and all of this stuff is generated by the Wikipedia website and put over there. 
but the content over here is end user generated right same thing with facebook right the portion that shows your uh, your photo and shows the overall layout of facebook that is generated by facebook but what you see on your wall that is generated by end users okay so the stuff that is generated by facebook statically that facebook has control over we will call trusted content and the portion that end users generate that is displayed as part of the web applications html output to you but that is generated by end users we will call that untrusted html okay and attacks come from untrusted html because untrusted html are what end users interact with and therefore can embed you know things like script tags and so on in this portion of the untrusted web page and then and, and somehow send it off to to you where it's rendered on your web browser so we have to be careful about untrusted html that's the net effect of that's the net sort of message of what i'm trying to convey to you and this is the crux of the challenge also right on facebook right go and try to type some you know malicious content or you know some script content on this untrusted html part and see what happens right facebook is a very well engineered website you are unlikely to find any bugs uh, and if you do you are going to be a very rich man because if you report it uh, you know facebook has a very very uh, good bug bounty program okay so again over here right i mean this is i don't know what this is this is uh, i don't even like the name of that website deviant art okay whatever it is right you can see some trusted content and some untrusted content by the way these slides are not mine these are from the uh, authors of the paper um, okay all right so cross site scripting as you uh, uh, are already familiar is an attack that works by injecting code into this untrusted html uh, content portion of the web page <coughs> and it exploits this client side browser parsing <coughs> okay so we saw that you know if something is parsed as a script it's actually going to execute as a script on that uh, on that web browser okay so the way that the attack works is that of course the hacker injects code in this into this untrusted section and when an innocent user visits that web page the client browser displays all the content and then if that stuff that the attacker injected is going to be executed as code or parsed as code so the browser uh, the parsing is very closely tied to the back end execution because if the browser parses something as code then it's going to be passed over to the javascript interpreter we will see the workflow in a couple of slides and all of that stuff is going to be executed okay so the javascript right i mean so we we it's it's all based on javascript and you know there are two kinds of 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 cross site scripting attacks of course you know non persistent which is reflected the kind that we saw and also persistent where you know you might actually store this uh this uh, uh 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 the attack script somewhere and you know every time you open this web page that script is going to be rendered so that's called persistent or stored cross site scripting attacks regardless the vulnerability lies on the server side where uh you know the uh, uh, untrusted html content is not validated okay so a lot of examples i think i don't know whether this website is still active there used to be a website called xss.com where you can go and look at uh, a list of all websites that currently have cross site scripting vulnerabilities believe it or not cross site scripting vulnerabilities continue to this day right i mean it's not like websites are free of it now okay so here is a cross site scripting example uh, okay so let's look at this right uh, uh because it's it's important for us to understand uh the context of how the defense works okay so uh um, you know supposing you have like a blog right where the end user types something uh so this is something that you expect to see maybe in a blog comment that you know maybe somebody has left a behind html uh, a comment that includes the html tags right here's a page that you might find very interesting and they want to decorate it with this html tags you know b and uh, close b so this is actually displayed in bold maybe they want to include a link maybe they actually want to uh, uh, format their their comment properly so they're using the p tag to ensure that you know something is a paragraph this is a benign html comment right now if the web server is not doing any filtering and is going to allow for arbitrary Uh, uh, uh tags to be included this is what a malicious html comment may look like 
right? What you can see is, you know, there is a script over here with do some do evil function, doesn't matter exactly what, but there is, you know, there is a script tag. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, the B is still there. So this is going to be displayed, but the script is going to be executed. Again, over here, you have JavaScript. This is not new line, but it is another, you know, sort of uh, uh, character that is probably going to be ignored by the, by the web server. But at the end of the day, when the browser renders it, it's going to be treated as JavaScript. That's another way of embedding this do evil function. Here's another way of embedding the do evil function, right? You have got something called style no op expression. These style tags over here, they are uh, functionally equivalent to cascading style sheets in HTML. So you can specify a particular style and uh, that's functionally equivalent to having a separate CSS uh, uh, or cascading style sheet. And over here, you know, as we saw when we saw uh, uh, this uh, MySpace Sammy verb, that was also taking advantage of uh, uh, script uh, or HTML content in cascading style sheets. This is another way of embedding your, uh, your uh, evil JavaScript. Okay, so all of these are different ways of embedding your malicious JavaScript. And so any uh, self-respecting cross-site scripting defense must be able to distinguish all of these cases and defend against all of them. Oops. Yeah. Okay, so for some reason, my, my, my laptop is behaving strangely today. I'm skipping two slides at a time. Uh, so, all right. Yeah. So let's see if XSS.com is actually active. It used to list all uh, websites where you know you have these uh, uh, these cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. So let's see if it's active. Maybe it is uh, www.xss.com um, cross-site scripting. Oh yeah, it is still active, right? Uh, okay, and uh, you can see the XSS archive. You can see all other websites that still have. Uh, Cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. Unfortunately, it's a bit out of date. It's five years out of date. So I think they've stopped updating for some reason. But anyway, you can go and look at the uh, archived website and see which website still had at that point active cross-site scripting attacks, uh, which ones had uh, fixed. You can see important websites over here, store.samsung.com, uh, that had cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. So it's a big deal. Right? Okay. Uh, okay. So what I'm going to describe to you now is this particular defense called Blueprint uh, that has the following goals, right? So you can come up with standards that browsers should follow. So for example, you can say, look, don't treat Java new line script as valid JavaScript. Uh, only treat JavaScript as a valid JavaScript if the tag is just going to read JavaScript. Now, who is going to come up with these regulations? Well, it's the World Wide Web Consortium or W3C. Now, the problem is that if W3C sets up a standard, the standard has to be implemented in browsers and that development cycle takes quite a bit of time. So you don't want to rely on that even though that's the best practice, that's the best way to, to normalize and get rid of cross-site scripting over time. You, uh, you want an immediate solution, right? So you don't necessarily have to rely on these W3C plus the browser vendors to uh, uh, to respond, you want it to work irrespective of whichever browser you're, you're using. Um, so that leads to the next point as well. You know, the end user should not really know about uh, or have to uh, actively be part of the defense. Uh, it should work on all current browsers, no matter what browser you're doing. And it should also work irrespective of what plugins you're using in the browser. This is goes back to the point that I was talking about a few minutes earlier, the sense that extensions tend to uh, uh, radically change uh, browser behavior. So it should work irrespective of what extensions you have. Okay. And you should retain the expressiveness of untrusted HTML in the sense that, you know, you should still be able to have a rich set of HTML tags and untrusted content, whatever the, the web developer wants. Uh, so you should not completely, you know, restrict the web developer from saying, hey, you know, no HTML tags. That's an easy way to uh, to prevent this attack, but you should still retain the expressiveness of this, right? In fact, I would challenge you to go and put simple HTML tags like, uh, like uh, you know, these B tags in your, uh, in your Facebook and see what happens. I don't know what they do now, 
uh, honestly speaking, I don't know. Try to put a bold tag, an italics tag, and see what happens, whether the content is actually rendered in that way. Uh, so the point is that you should not rely on the browser to parse this data, right? I mean, because if the browser parses the data, then that also gives the attacker a chance to, to inject scripts over there. You should be able to tell the browser where executable content is and where executable content is not. So, for example, you know, you can say that, look, I can accept block comments, but the block comment part should never be the source of an executable script that's ever executed by the browser. That's ideally what you want, right? Include whatever tags you want, but never start executing any code that you insert into the block comment part of the, of the web application. Uh, so, if you can somehow implement that, you have a solution for cross-site scripting attacks. But how do you tell the browser that? That's what this particular defense talks about. Okay, so the, the high-level idea behind this defense is that you want to enable web applications and web application developers to create a blueprint. That's, that explains the name of the paper. A blueprint is nothing but a plan, right? It's whenever you create a, you build a house, you, you draw a blueprint of the of the of the you know the the floor plan and so on so just like that a blueprint is just a plan for where the untrusted web content uh, is going to be and uh, where the trusted content is going to be and if you have such a blueprint uh, that's clear in the mind of the web application developer then that blueprint will automatically guide you because you do not expect to see any scripts executing in this untrusted portion of the of the web page okay so that's the basic idea behind this behind this defense so let's we are going to see some complicated pictures in the next few slides don't get overwhelmed by it that's just the real world flow of how the web browser actually parses content uh, the web browser is actually an incredibly complex piece of software it's just gotten more and more complex as end users want more and more interactive and fancy looking content at the end of the day, it's the browser that's responsible for uh, for parsing and rendering it. Therefore, that complexity has to be there somewhere, and that that somewhere is the web browser. So this is pretty much how you know your browser uh, interprets HTML, right? So whenever you get HTML uh, code from a website, uh, your browser starts working like this, right? So your browser takes the HTML code. The first thing that it does is that it you know, it tokenizes it. So if you're, if you've taken a course on compilers, these terms should be familiar with you. It tokenizes it using a lexer and then it parses it. Okay. Uh, for the minute, what I'm going to do is, so this is a picture directly from the, from the paper. I, I would request you to actually ignore the, uh, the, uh, the arrows that are shown in bold. That is part of the, of the defense. In any case, right, what happens is that once you parse the HTML, you get a parse tree, right? The parse tree actually uh, uh, tells the, uh, the the browser, you know, where is the cascading style sheet located? Are there any URLs that must be followed? You know, what is the overall structure of the of the uh, of the document? That also tells the browser where JavaScript code is located inside the web page, right? HTML content comes embedded with JavaScript. So you have to sort of first figure that out and that's the step. The parse tree tells the browser where various elements are and whenever there is JavaScript code within that, uh, within that HTML parse tree, that JavaScript code has got to be executed, right? So now that's the task of the JavaScript engine that's embedded within the web browser. So all the web browser does, the, the parsing engine does, is that it gives off the JavaScript code over to the JavaScript interpreter, which then again does the same thing. It tokenizes the JavaScript and then it parses it, and then now you have a JavaScript parse tree, right? Which is basically a structure, a representation of where of, of the JavaScript that is then parsed over to the JavaScript runtime environment. Okay, so the JavaScript executes, and the important thing about JavaScript is that because it can interact live with the HTML page, right? It can actually modify the context of the HTML page. It can also interact with the browser's document object model API or the DOM API. This is a very common term, DOM, D-O-M, stands for document object model. This is nothing but a tree structured representation of the contents that you see on your web page. Okay, so uh, whenever you look at a web page, you can actually think about it as a tree structure with the top level being the HTML document, and then you have iframes, 
within that iframe, maybe you have a div tag, maybe you have a bold tag and so on. So you can actually represent it as a tree. That's called the DOM. So the JavaScript runtime environment interacts with the DOM API, uh, predictably so, because the JavaScript can actually modify the DOM, right? So for example, you know, let's say you have a web page where, you know, when you hover over uh, elements in the web page, you see a pop-up box. We see so many such websites. How do they work? Well, the JavaScript is actually executing actively so that when you hover over that element, that element is causing a new DOM object to be created, this pop-up box that's then displayed on your web browser. So what is that pop-up box, right? Well, that pop-up box can contain further HTML code, which then goes back to the HTML parser and so on, right? So in some sense, what you see over here is an infinite loop. And the reason it's an infinite loop is, well, there's a good reason for it, right? Because new JavaScript can create new HTML, which can then, you know, have embedded JavaScript in it and so on. So the HTML uh, parsing process is a lifelong parsing process for as long as that web page is active. So that's why you see like this cycle over here where, you know, HTML code gives rise to JavaScript code, which can in, uh, in turn give rise to more HTML and JavaScript and so on, right? So that's this, this, uh, uh, this the HTML interpretation process. And the key to this particular solution is for the blueprint defense to tell when to execute JavaScript code and when not to execute JavaScript code as part of this HTML parse tree, right? So whenever you parse the HTML, if you have a way of saying, you know, there is some trusted content and some untrusted content, you need to pass that information along and tell the browser saying, uh, you know, if it is trusted HTML content, you can execute the JavaScript code. Whereas if it is untrusted HTML content, do not execute what you see there as JavaScript code, rather just render it as text. And that is what you see in these dark arrows over here, right? So the dark arrows are going to be part of the defense. You will see this in much, explain in much more detail in the next few slides, but that's what I'm saying, right? If there is untrusted code, just bypass the JavaScript interpreter completely so that whatever you see, you know, embedded within these script tags is not ever going to go through the JavaScript runtime where, you know, it will be executed as code, but rather render it as plain text. And if you render it as plain text, you've got to display it somewhere within the, the web browser. And that's why this arrow over here, the Q arrow, goes to the document model, uh, object model API, where it's just displayed as plain text. Okay. So let me go over the defense in slightly more detail. So the DOM, as I said, is just a tree structured representation of everything that you see on your web page. So here is example of the DOM, right? The HTML has a head and a body. The head can contain a title tag, style tag, strips, and so on. And the body also contains like a tree structured representation. The DOM is nothing but a tree structured representation of what you see rendered on your web page. Okay. So what this does, what the Blueprint solution does is that it is a server-side library. Blueprint is a server-side library that allows web application developers to include a library that uh, allows them to encode their security policy that says which portion of the web page is trusted, which is not trusted. And the overall goal is to reduce the browser's influence in parsing this HTML, cascading style sheets, and so on by taking control over the browser parsing uh, process. So the browser parsing, that diagram that you saw, goes on as shown over there for the trusted portion, but for the untrusted portion, you want Blueprint to take control, okay? So the server basically encodes uh, uh, chunks as models, right? So uh, don't get overwhelmed by this term. All this is saying is that the server is basically encoding a model of the web page which encapsulates within the model, you know, which portions of the web page are trusted and which portions of the web page are likely to get end user generated content and therefore must be treated as untrusted. And the server API basically uses a whitelist to look at these models. And if you have any data that's generated in this untrusted portion, those are rendered as syntactically inert characters. Okay. So a script tag is just going to be displayed as a, uh, uh, as a text script rather than triggering the uh, execution of the JavaScript interpreter. Okay, and uh, these models are created at the web application developer's end and somehow they have to be transmitted and interpreted on the browser side where, you know, that model is going to guide the 
execution of the uh, of the uh, of the parsing life cycle and the way that they are embedded is using a special code html character but doesn't really matter uh, it's just a special character that tells the browser this portion should be interpreted as a model right and the whole thing comes packaged with a client side execution engine that's written in javascript uh, and uh, all of it is now going to be sort of prefixed with this underscore bp tag right again all of these are implementation details this is just blueprint that tells the browser okay execute this this is going to help you interpret the remaining code that's coming okay so let's look at an example okay so this is how you would program with the blueprint api right so on the left hand side it shows you how you would program a php web application right so the php web application maybe this is a php web application for a blog where you know you're receiving comments from the blog side and then this is just saying echo the comment on the generated web page okay and this is the untrusted portion because the comment can contain html content so instead what you do is you know you're saying look here's the blueprint api and this is php code right i'm going to take this comment and pass it over to the blueprint interpreter and then you echo whatever the model tells you right the model might say look over here no script execution allowed and therefore echoing the model would ensure that you know this browser is going to treat this stuff not as code but rather as as plain text and it's going to be now displayed in your web browser as plain text because blueprint says no code execution here okay so that's what that is okay so pictorially this is what is going on right you take the portion of the web page you take the web page split it into trusted and untrusted components and uh, everything that's an untrusted component that is for example you know all of this stuff over here is untrusted you encode them as models and then you uh, you let blueprint take care of the rendering of the untrusted portion so that's what this is all the untrusted stuff is going to be embedded as a model which this now the the model is 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 interpretable by the blueprint client side library the client side library is going to treat that as non executable code and then render it appropriately okay so if you see client side for example you know this uh, the stuff over here that's injected in the comment uh, previously what would happen is that that would be displayed the untrusted portion this stuff from before the snippet from before all of these do evils would have executed before now what happens is that because the um, uh, it's going to be so this is the comment over here right and uh, the comment is going to get sent over to the uh, uh, to the to the blog uh, uh, web application where because instead of just echoing the comment it's going to be embedded as a model and then displayed as a model this is how it's transformed right and this is the transformation function some ascii characters that represent the stuff that's going to denote the model and finally the model is going to be interpreted by the blueprint client side parser okay and the parser is packaged together with the with the code that's sent over to the browser as part of the header okay so what you see instead is that uh, you know uh, the 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 blueprint parser is going to take this bold path over here there are no script tags to be displayed just goes directly from the dom to this directly skipping the, the javascript runtime environment okay so that's the html that's presented to the client you get this trusted code together with a bunch of models these models are interpreted by the blueprint uh, runtime where they are passed by the blueprint runtime instead of passing it directly to the to the browser's parser therefore you know that whatever is displayed over here is going to be safe and in accordance with the blueprint policy which is decided by who by the web application developer so therefore whatever is displayed on the client side is now going to be in accordance with what the web application developer has in mind for how the web page should be uh, 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 should be rendered okay so if you have the blueprint uh, script uh, uh, the blueprint script is the header script that's going to interpret everything else uh, that's going to take the standard path a b c d e and any untrusted data that's part of the models the blueprint is now going to drive the path from here right it goes from a to b prime of course which is the same as b but now uh, the document generator because it's it's uh, it's it's untrusted data it takes the q path which is just plain text um, and this plain text might also interact 
to 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 render some string values you know maybe you just want to display a string rather than uh, executable script javascript is going to display that it might interact with the with the javascript runtime environment along those paths um, now you know you might also you know the document object model itself can create further elements right the way that it creates further elements and these are all of the subtleties of html right you can create further html with the dom api itself and that happens using something called document dot create element by the way whenever you see this document prefix in in javascript that document prefix that built in document prefix in javascript refers within javascript to the uh, to the dom api okay so document dot cookie is one example that you saw before document dot create element allows you to create new html elements document dot write allows you to write new html again, again to the to the dom web page it's a very rich api uh, that all uh, modern javascript interpreter support but basically the so many arrows that you see over here stem from the fact that you know modern javascript is an incredibly complex beast but the high level idea that you have to get from this is that whenever you have untrusted uh, content uh, the the blueprint uh, uh, client side library drives the, uh, the the parsing so that it goes directly over to the to the dom api and does not go over through the uh, javascript runtime environment where there is the potential for it to be interpreted as code and so that's what the blueprint uh, 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 you know the, the blueprint tool uh, enables okay so yeah so what they do more details right so they uh, encode the models using the syntactically inert language and the whole model is uh, is uh, decoded with the client side library uh, the, that's called the model interpreter and the model interpreter is the one that's responsible for you know driving the parsing this way right uh, through the queue through the queue pump okay uh, so uh, everything else is the same right uh, the models are uh, you know the visual look and feel if you are just got a benign web page is going to look pretty much the same as a traditional uh, uh, website right so the html parser's influence is reduced by means of this this blueprint okay so uh, i'm going to stop at this point the slides actually contain some uh, screenshots from their actual implementation as well as you know some performance numbers uh, there is not much point going over the performance numbers in this presentation because you know the paper is around uh, 12 years old at this point uh, but i will actually ask you to go and read the evaluation section to get an understanding of how to go about doing an evaluation right even if the numbers don't mean, mean much now it is important for you to understand how to design a performance evaluation what aspects to evaluate and so on so in that aspect i would ask you to go and read the evaluation of the paper but i'm not going to go over the numbers here this is from a conference talk where they did present the perf performance numbers they are not so important for the purposes of this class for the purposes of this class it's important to understand the methodology of how it worked that's what we went over right now okay so again you know this is just to summarize the contributions rather than going through the w3c development cycle the whole thing over here the idea over here was to um, sort of short circuit that and directly implement the the the, the solution by the web application developer specifying what's untrusted and uh, uh, you know, telling the browser to parse the contents uh, appropriately. Okay, um, there are some shortcomings, right? It's not a perfect defense, right? Now, uh, uh, the websites, the web application developers still have to actively modify their websites to use Blueprint. Uh, and, uh, you know, actually the Blueprint client sites uh, uh, execution engine is pretty large from the perspective of uh, 2009, it's around 16 KB. Each time you uh, you render a web page, that has to be first uh, parsed. So the loading time of a web page may increase, um, and uh, yeah, the size of the web page also may increase, which can be potentially a problem if you're on a low bandwidth network. Um, but that's it, right? That's the end of the presentation. That's that's blueprint for you. Um, let me very quickly stop. Take around five minutes of any questions that you may have. And uh, the next session on Monday, as I said, will be a, a review session. Uh, review session does not mean that I'm going to review things. Uh, it is going to be an open-ended session where I will wait for your questions, right? I mean, you can feel free to ask questions on uh, 
uh, in Monday's lecture and uh, we will have it as interactive as you guys choose to make it. Okay, so that's it from my side. Let me just uh, uh, pause the recording and uh,